What were you trying to do with her when you stabbed her? Kill her. I might as well just say it. We were trying to kill her. So why did you pick Peyton? I didn't pick her. Who picked her? Whoever Anissa was talking about. She made it seem necessary. This is going to get me arrested, isn't it? When you're young, it's normal to have some irrational fears. When you were a child, maybe you were afraid of some sort of creature lurking in the dark, or you thought that there was a monster hiding under your bed. When you grow older, though, you realize that these things are only figments of your imagination. They do not exist. In this shocking story, two young girls came to believe in a fictional monster so strongly that they were willing to do anything for him, even commit horrific, evil acts. They believed that this was what the monster wanted, and that in return for doing the unthinkable, he would reward them. In reality though, the truly evil part of this story was not some fictional creature, it was them. So many people have followed this story for so long, including us, and this is the first time that Peyton Leitner is talking. Do you remember leaving the park to go to the woods? This is the most unbelievable story I've ever heard. Who the heck is Slender Man? 12-year-old Peyton Lutner of Wisconsin was a thoughtful and caring young girl who was known for being a friend to everyone, even those who many would consider an outsider. Go back five years ago to 12-year-old Peyton. How would you describe her? Hopeful, positive, um, an animal lover. I saw the good in people. One of the people who Peyton saw the good in was Morgan Geyser. Peyton and Morgan had been friends for years. Even as a young child, Peyton recognized Morgan didn't really have any friends, so she went out of her way to reach out and befriend her. For a long time, Peyton was the only friend that Morgan had. I didn't want her to be alone. She was my only friend for a long time. Because Why would you hurt your only friend? It was necessary. But even after Peyton's kindness and friendship for all that time, Morgan would later not hesitate to betray her in the worst way possible. Morgan eventually made another friend named Anissa Wire. Anissa was the new girl at school that year and didn't really know anyone yet. Soon, Anissa, Morgan, and Peyton all started hanging out together on a regular basis. While Peyton was friends with Anissa too, Morgan seemed to be a little closer to her. It would be this new friendship between Anissa and Peyton that would very soon soon turn into something incredibly dark and dangerous, and not one person saw it coming. It all began one Friday evening in May of 2014. It was Morgan's birthday, and she was having a small party, followed by a sleepover with just her, Peyton, and Anissa. Peyton's parents had no reason to worry when they agreed to let her go to the party. After all, she had known Morgan for a long time. Peyton's mom recalled watching her daughter pack her American Girl doll to bring with her. She figured that the girls would just be doing the normal 12-year-old girl activities. I think back when I was 12, I played Barbies at sleepovers. So that's what I expected to be happening, playing with dolls and spending some time on the internet. And as far as Peyton knew, that's what the plan was. This was just going to be a casual night with a couple of friends. She was excited because she knew they were going to go to Skateland to go roller skating. She could have never imagined that these two girls, who she believed to be some of her closest friends, had something unspeakably horrible planned for her. I've always been pretty good at roller skating, so I was going around doing my own thing. We were at Skateland having a good time. Did you guys talk about the plan at all? When the girls headed back to Morgan's house after the skate park for the sleepover, Morgan's mom noticed that they seemed to all be in good spirits and having a nice time. What she didn't know, and what she could have never imagined, was that her daughter had planned to take her best friend's life that night. But ultimately, Anissa and Morgan did not end up going through with their evil plan that night, the way that they had talked about. They thought that they were being merciful to Peyton by allowing her one last morning of life. They played up in Morgan's bedroom ran up and down the stairs giggling and laughing and I mean it was just a normal night. I wanted to give her at least one more morning. Morning came and went, and the girls were discussing what they wanted to do that day. Morgan wanted to go to the park that was near her home. Normally, Morgan would not be allowed to go to the park without an adult, but she pleaded with her mother until she gave in. After all, this was Morgan's birthday, and this was what she wanted to do. The next morning, then, they wake up, they have breakfast, they play games, they then go to the park. But the girls weren't going to the park to play, like Morgan's mom thought they were doing. Morgan and Anissa were planning on the park being the setting that they were going to follow through with their evil plan. Still, Peyton did not suspect a thing. She had no reason to. How could this 12-year-old girl ever even guess that this was what her friends were planning for her? When Morgan suggested that they all three play hide-and-seek, Peyton agreed. She was just moments away from being the victim of an unspeakably evil and horrific act. And then we said that we were going to play hide-and-seek. It happened really fast. 
I'm thinking, dear God, this is really happening. Meanwhile, Dan Klein, an officer for the Waukesha County Law Enforcement, was having a typical day on the job. He was enjoying the nice spring day and had no idea that the call he would soon receive would be one that he would never, ever forget for the rest of his life. He had helped out on a lot of different cases throughout his life, but nothing ever like this one. Saturday, May 31st, 2014. It was one of our first nice weather days that we've had on a Saturday. Sunny, 72 degrees gorgeous day out. I thought, well, the earlier I get in, the earlier I get out. Officer Klein's shift had started out with a laugh. He had been called out to the local family video store because someone had come and rearranged the letters of their marquee sign to spell out an inappropriate message. This was the kind of crime that people in this small town in Wisconsin were used to. Nothing like the gory, brutal crime that would take place there that day. Officer Klein pulled out his phone to snap a picture of the message so he could send it to his wife. It was just as he was about to take the picture that the call came in. Just as I was trying to take my phone out, over my radio, I heard that a 12-year-old girl had been stabbed about a mile and a half away from this location. One, one, one. And I'm transferring over a caller on Big Bend. Came upon a 12-year-old female. She appears to be... She appears to be what? As you can tell by that 911 call, Officer Klein thought he was mishearing the operator at first. How could something like this have happened to a 12-year-old girl? Who did this and why? What he would soon find out was that the girl who had been stabbed was Peyton, and the people who did this to her were her own best friends, Morgan and Anissa. Greg Steinberg was the man who discovered Peyton, and it was really only by chance that he found her. Greg went for a bike ride every single Saturday, but on this particular Saturday, he had gone a different route than usual. He was biking through a forest not far from where the girls had been playing that day when he saw her. It was an incredibly disturbing sight. Peyton was covered in blood and she had clearly been attacked. I quick got out my cell phone. I was shaking and dialed 911 and I just stayed with the 911. She was right here in the grass. Exactly. But you had no idea how many times she'd act. No. This was Greg's voice on that harrowing 911 call. Okay, sir, are you with her right now? Yes. Is she awake? She's awake. Is there any bleeding going on? Her clothing has got blood on it. Peyton was in such severe shape that Greg didn't even know how to begin to help her. He offered her water and assured her that the ambulance was going to be there soon. Peyton told him that she could hardly breathe and Greg knew that she probably didn't have much time left. Using what little breath she had, Peyton told her rescuer what had happened to her and Greg could hardly believe his ears. He's coming. Did that to you. Officer Dan arrived on the scene before the ambulance did. He approached Peyton and asked her if she was okay. She said no. It wasn't until he got close enough to see the full extent of her injuries that he realized just how horrific a scene this was. And as I got closer, I started to see a little bit more blood. Um, and the closer I got, the more blood I saw. Somehow she'd been able to pull herself out of those woods. And in another moment of strength, she was able to communicate with him. I asked her who did this and she told me her friend, Morgan. Despite the fact that Peyton's small body had been sliced with a knife 19 times and she was in an incredible amount of pain, she still managed to explain what had happened. Morgan and Anissa had led her out to the woods and brutally attacked her over and over again. She waited until they were gone and then she dragged her battered body out into the path where she could be seen by Greg when he was biking through. At first, Officer Klein thought that Peyton must be confused. Surely another child hadn't done this to her. Maybe it happened some other way. But the more details that she told him, the more it became clear to him that there were two very dangerous attempted killers on the loose. Law enforcement needed to find Morgan and Anissa immediately. If they would do this to Peyton, what was stopping them from doing it to someone else? But the first priority was getting Peyton medical treatment immediately to try to save her life. Despite how severe her injuries were, Peyton was still able to explain to the paramedics what happened and what type of weapon was used. She was even able to describe the length of the blade. Peyton was rushed to the hospital where she would have to go through surgery as doctors worked as fast as they could to repair the damage done nearly across all of her body. There were wounds in her chest and abdomen, her arms and her legs. Her heart had been working so hard at keeping her alive that her blood pressure had begun to drop 
dramatically. Meanwhile, Officer Klein had the difficult task of notifying all three of the girl's parents. When Peyton's mother heard that her daughter was in the hospital after an attempted murder, she could not wrap her head around the fact that Morgan was believed to be the one to have done this to her. There had to be some mistake. Morgan is 12. Morgan didn't do this, is what's going through my head. There's no way. Now police decide they've got to go to Morgan Geyser's house to figure out how this happened. When officers arrived at the front step of Peyton's home, her mother Stacy immediately knew that something was horribly wrong. She was mentally preparing for some terrible news. She was very calm, uh, very collected. She knew that something was going on. I don't think she knew exactly to what extent it was. They said, is Peyton home? And I said, no. And they said, was she at a sleepover last night? And I said, yeah, she was. When Stacy found out that her daughter had been attacked, her first question was if she was still alive. The officers explained that she was, but she was in pretty serious bad condition. These were not superficial wounds. They were life-threatening injuries. If Peyton survived this, it would not be without lots of procedures, surgeries, treatment, and who knows how long she would be in the hospital for. It would be a long road to recovery, and that was only if she survived. Officers told Stacy that she would need to call her husband immediately and get to the hospital as fast as she could. Peyton was going to need her, so that's what she did. Stacy arrived just before her daughter was about to go into surgery. There were doctors and nurses rushing around, trying to get a sense of Peyton's condition. Stacy listened as they began counting the slash wounds that covered her daughter's body. And when they got to the total, 19 different wounds, she could hardly believe it. How could it be? I walked into the trauma room that she was in and she was pale as a ghost. She was terrified. She was crying, she couldn't breathe. And all I hear is, there's five on her arm, there's seven on her leg, and I'm thinking, what, seven, what? And one of the nurses says, all right, I count 19, and then the second nurse said, I count 19 as well. The wounds were so extensive that the nurses had to keep checking over Peyton's body to make sure they hadn't missed any. It was a crime that anyone would have believed had been done with passion, anger, and possibly even hatred. The agony that Peyton was in when she was first brought into the hospital was clear on her face. It was an expression that a lead detective on the case will remember for the rest of her life. I was waiting in the ER and Peyton was brought in by stretcher. The look on her face is something that I will never forget. Uh, she, she looked like she was in an extreme amount of pain. Meanwhile, all Stacy could do was try to comfort her daughter and assure her that she was going to pull through this and everything was going to be okay. She didn't know this for sure herself, but it was something that she needed to believe. While doctors were doing all they could to save Peyton's life, officers had showed up at the doorstep at Morgan's house. Her mother, Angie Geyser, answered the door. They asked me, where's Morgan? I said, she's at the park with her friends. Angie Geyser told us that there was three girls, a third girl named Anissa, and the three girls left earlier in the morning for the park, and they hadn't heard from them since. All Angie had done was agree to let her 12-year-old daughter go with her friends to the park, and now there were officers searching her house. She had no idea what happened, but it was clearly something horrific. So I just kept asking, you know, what happened? What's going on? And they, they wouldn't tell me other than to say there had been an incident at the park and one of the girls was hurt. It must have been incredibly hard to process. Angie still didn't know where her daughter was or what she had been accused of yet, but if the way that the officers were dressed and how they were acting was any indication, clearly Morgan was believed to have done something really, really bad. Not only were there police in my living room, but they were wearing riot gear. When the lead detective on the case began to explain to Angie what Morgan was being accused of doing to Peyton, she was beyond shocked. She had not seen a single sign of this coming. Her daughter was not a trouble Maker. She was not violent, and yet she had been accused of attempted murder? The thing that really struck me is the way that she portrayed her daughter to be, that she was totally normal, she was a good kid, and she thought that this was totally out of character for Morgan to be involved in anything like this. Neither Anissa or Morgan had gone back to the Geyser home, so the next family that detectives needed to get in contact with immediately was the Ware family. They needed to find out if the girls had tried hiding out at Anissa's house. Bill, my ex-husband, called me and told me to get to the condo as soon as possible. The police are there looking for Anissa. Detectives began combing through the wire home, and they couldn't find either Anissa or Morgan. They still hadn't told Christy, Anissa's mother, what was going on, but she was becoming more and more worried. Where's my daughter? 
That's the only thought I had in my head. I looked at her cell phone, checked all of her text messages, trying to figure out the people that she called and contacted last. While Christy was searching her daughter's phone to see if she could find any information about where she could have gone, she found something disturbing. It was what seemed to be a goodbye note written by Anissa. The way that the note was phrased had both Christy and law enforcement worried that Anissa and Morgan could be planning on taking their own lives. This made the need to find them all the more urgent. Breaking news, a 12-year-old girl is leading to a big police search in Waukesha. The news of what happened had spread through the community and caused shock and horror. One young girl was attacked and nearly killed, and two other young girls were missing. Police are still investigating. They still have this neighborhood shut down. We had just an overwhelming police presence throughout the communities. There were squad cars zooming everywhere. Law enforcement had brought out all the resources they had to help find these missing girls. There were helicopters hovering over the community and dogs that were being used to help within the search for Morgan and Anissa. My daughter was supposed to be at a slumber party and now she's missing. When things like this happen, it causes people to look back and try and see if there was some sort of sign or red flag that they had missed. Morgan was a very happy child. She was intensely creative. She was always making up songs and stories. When Anissa's mom, Christy, looked back, she recalled thinking that her daughter was somewhat of an outsider. Looking back, Anissa was never really invited to a lot of birthday parties or anything. I don't think she really made friends that easy. Morgan's mom could remember watching her typically cheerful daughter change after she was the victim of bullying in the sixth grade. She started to become moodier and a little bit more reclusive. But still, what preteen girl doesn't go through mood shifts and changes doesn't mean that they're gonna become a cold-hearted killer, at least not most of the time. After a panicked search, law enforcement were able to track down Anissa and Morgan walking together along the hall. Way. They picked them up and brought them in for questioning. Back at the station, law enforcement were trying to make some sort of sense out of what had happened here. What would cause these girls to do something like that? How could they have hated anyone this much? Nothing could have prepared the detectives for what they were about to hear. In fact, I don't know the last time uh, I have seen two 12-year-old girls in separate interrogation rooms about to uh, describe in excruciating detail what it is that played out in the woods. One of the first things law enforcement noticed was that Anissa seemed to be at least a little nervous, but Morgan was completely at ease, so much so that it was pretty eerie. She had just brutally attacked and tried to kill someone, and she was acting like nothing happened. The other thing they noticed was the red blood stains on her clothes. Morgan seemed like she was very calm, very relaxed. I mean, she's at a police department and she's covered in blood and this is like a normal day for her. Throughout the girls' interrogations, you'll notice that they don't ever use the name Peyton. They call her Bella instead, a shortened version of Isabella, which is Peyton's middle name. Why were they not using her first name? It's possible that saying it would make things more real. Do you know what happened to Bella? Is she dead? I don't know. I'm just taken to the hospital. I was just wondering. Morgan seems to be somewhat surprised to hear that Peyton was taken to the hospital. This could be because she assumed she was already dead. Slowly, investigators began breaking down what gave the girls the idea to kill Peyton. Morgan made it seem like it had all been Anissa's idea and it was just something that she agreed to and went along with. What were you trying to do with her when you stabbed her? Kill her. I might as well just say it. We were trying to kill her. So why did you pick Peyton? I didn't pick her. Who picked her? Whoever Anissa was talking about. She made it seem necessary. This is when the urban legend, Slenderman, finally comes into the story. The girls had learned about this fictional character online and had done a lot of reading and researching about him. It eventually became a complete obsession. There's this website full of like, horror stories and there's one of those called the girls began to believe that if they did what Slender Man wanted, he would reward them, and what he wanted was for them to make a human sacrifice. This is going to get me arrested, isn't it? Morgan seems to continue to try to play the innocent victim card here by saying she believed that this monster would kill her family if she didn't go along with Anissa's plan to kill someone. Anissa told me we had to. Why? Because she said that he'd kill our family. Who's he? 
Um, a man. I didn't know him. When the detectives interview Anissa, it became clear to them that Anissa didn't just truly believe in Slenderman, but she was afraid of him. Who's Slenderman? He's, um, he's, uh, this tall, faceless man who preys on children. He could be anywhere from six feet to 14 feet tall. He's a tall guy who constantly wears a suit of, he doesn't have a face. Anissa truly believed that she had seen Slender Man with her own eyes. I actually thought that he was real because I saw him. We were sitting in the living room and I saw him talking on the bus. I look out the window and I see this supposed snake standing like this with tendrils. Looks exactly like a tree. Um, they are gone like that. As crazy as it might sound, Anissa and Morgan believed that if they completed the mission of successfully killing Peyton, they would be able to go and live with him in his mansion, which was supposedly located out in the middle of nowhere. Morgan said, we have to kill Bella. In fact, that was actually where the girls were heading after they attacked Peyton and believed they had killed her. They were going to go on foot to find Slenderman for themselves. Morgan found out that Slender has a state mansion in the middle of National Park. As detectives interviewed these truly messed up girls, another very intriguing thing that they discovered was just how deep the bond between Anissa and Morgan really was. We're so close, we're like sisters. Anissa and Morgan had bonded over the fact that they had both been bullied in the past. Because of this, they were willing to do anything for each other, even kill for them. According to Peyton, Anissa had never seemed to like her very much. She seemed to view her as a threat. She didn't want to have to share Morgan with her. She was always cruel to me. I feel like she was jealous that Morgan was friends with me and her. Morgan tells detectives that after finding a friend like Anissa, she was willing to do whatever it took not to lose that friendship. She believed that murdering Peyton was what she would have to do to make Anissa happy and not jeopardize their friendship. I didn't really understand what we were doing, but I really didn't want to make Anissa so mad. It's, um... Hard enough to make friends. I don't want to lose them over something like this. But what about Peyton's friendship? Peyton had been Morgan's friend long before she had ever even met Anissa, and yet somehow none of that mattered to her now? While detectives talked to Morgan about what she expected to happen after the murder, it is as if she had completely come to terms with her fate and accepted whatever was going to happen to her now. What did you think was going to happen after you stabbed Peyton? I don't really know. I figured that I'd get in trouble eventually, though. Because, um, mommy always says that whatever you do catches up to you eventually. And it did. If there was one thing that Morgan was right about, it was that. While she and Anissa might not have expected to face any repercussions for trying to kill their best friend, it would soon become clear that they would. Both girls were charged with attempted first degree intentional homicide, but their charges very nearly could have been murder if Peyton had not managed to pull through and survive. Peyton spent seven days in the hospital following the attack. She had what many said was nothing short of a miraculous recovery. It was astounding that she not only managed to survive, but that she was able to drag herself through the woods while in so much pain after just being brutally slashed over and over 19 different times. How did she possibly do it? When she recovered well enough to answer, her parents asked her that question. Well, we asked her and she said I wanted to live. Throughout her recovery, the one thing that helped keep Peyton in high spirits the most was being around animals. It was the only thing that her parents said brought a smile back to their daughter's face after the unspeakable horrors that she had to go through. And she has the most beautiful smile. Did that disappear? Yeah. For a little while. We see peaks of it every once in a while. Do you feel like your daughter's been stolen from you? For the time being. We'll get her back. More than nine years have passed since the brutal attack. So what happened to Morgan and Anissa? Well, as for Morgan, it was determined pretty early on that she clearly was not right in the head. She had a major psychotic break after her arrest and began carrying on conversations with multiple fictional characters. This not only included Slenderman, but Severus Snape as well. Tests eventually found that she was suffering from early onset schizophrenia. She was treated through medication and therapy and was eventually determined to be mentally stable enough to stand trial. But when the case went to trial, a jury eventually found both Morgan and Anissa not guilty 
by reason of mental insanity or defect. But don't worry, that doesn't mean that they got to just go back to their normal lives after what they did to Peyton. Both Anissa and Morgan were committed to a mental institution where they will be treated for their mental delusions. They will have to stay there until it can be determined that they would never ever do something like this to another human being again. On the day of her sentencing, Morgan apologized to Peyton and her family. I just want to let Bella and her family know I'm sorry. Today, this was Geyser's message to the surviving victim. Morgan was sentenced to spend 40 years to life in a mental facility, while Anissa was sentenced to only 25 years to life. But after Anissa wrote a long letter to the court expressing her remorse for what happened, she was granted early release after just seven years. She will still be under supervision though until she is at least 35 years old. As of February 2023, Morgan is still trying to prove to the court that she deserves her freedom. She has petitioned for a conditional release, something that she has been denied for twice in the past. But this time it could be different. She's made incredible strides and I think she's in a position now to, to come home. Do you believe that Morgan is truly remorseful for what she did and deserves her freedom? Or should she stay locked up where she won't be able to hurt another innocent person like she did to Peyton? Let us know what you think in the comments. Thanks for watching and don't forget to subscribe.